Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thank all my speakers. I will make. They will make my life easier to share. Thank you. Uh, well, it is light is the subject. Now let's make use of light, not only to see things, not only to produce electrical energy, not only to heat, but also to treat diseases. I mean, it's an interesting use of light uh, to keep us healthy, or if we are not healthy, to try and, and, and cure us. So I'll give the floor to Miguel uh, Castel Branco. He will tell us a little bit about how to use light to treat us. OK. Uh, shall I do it in English? In English or in Portuguese? In English, okay. So uh, I would like to thank uh, the organization, uh, Rosalia and Anna, for uh, this kind invitation. I'm uh, a medical doctor, so in be between engineers, but most of what I do is in fact biomedical engineering. So I do a lot, we do, a lot of neuroscience, but also apply a, a lot of uh, engineering to our methods. So I put here this wording, interactions between light and matter, because in fact we use a, a lot of this for uh, imaging. So in fact our institute is very much devoted to the concept of light in terms of biology, seeing. So I work in a vision and neuroscience institute. But we also apply a lot of light-based technologies for imaging. And I will not be very detailed. I will just show you a bit of what we are doing and what are the challenges in this area. Of course, when we talk about interactions between light and matter, I will first talk about interactions between light and biological matter, which are the photoreceptors, which are the best, the most wonderful type of sensors you can think of concerning light. In fact, we know that our retina can work over several orders of magnitude, several logarithmic scales, and actually we have a circuit that switches on and off for day and night. So it's the most amazing circuit you can imagine, and I will, I will try to make some links into the computational neuroscience or how you can design very nice systems based on biology. So I will... I will not go into details, but let me just tell you that we have very specialized sensors. For night vision, we call them rods. And these sensors have very specialized membranes, which accumulate a lot of pho photopigment. So biology has specialized to interact with light. And the next slide shows you, this is uh, actually the, in fact, it's difficult to see. But the most important thing I wanted to see is this one, the interaction of a photon with rhodopsin. So this is the phenomenon we call phototransduction. This is one of the biological phenomena we know most about. In fact, we know that even a single interaction can be sufficient to lead to perception. We also know a lot of the biophysics that amplifies this signal in the membrane, but I will not go into that detail. But when we think about vision, and disorders of vision, we think of very much about this interaction between photon and the protein, rhodopsin, how this signal is amplified and how things can go wrong in disease. In fact, these mechanisms in vision are now, some of them, accessible to gene therapy. The first successes in gene therapy have actually come from this field. But now, the light, color, and vision are very important for anthropology and ecology. So if you look at this scene, imagine you are a primate, an ancestor primate. You look at this scene, not, nothing so interesting. And probably many of you missed the fruits. So they were there, but you missed them. And this uh, light or color experience is uh, seminal in our evolution. So, in fact, many of the old world monkeys, the European, the ones that migrated to Africa, uh, actually had already acquired 
the three, uh, the three uh, basic pigments for trichromatic color vision. But the most of the monkeys that remained in South America, most of them only f a few females, it depends on the species, but there are many species that only females can see the fruits. And of course, at some point in evolution, maybe seeing the fruits was important for survival. So that's a theory based on color and light that said color and light perception was, were crucial for survival. This is the so-called frugivorous hypothesis because the detection of fruits is crucial for survival. There are other theories, uh, but I will not, just to, to, to tell you how important light and color are for biology and how uh, we need to think a lot, not just in the retina, but in fact in the brain. And uh, we have also a wonderful technique to visualize single photoreceptors in living retinas, in living human retinas, and this actually relates very well to engineering. Uh, most of you or some of you know about a technique called adaptive optics. So astronomists develop techniques to see further and further, correcting for haze effects, to see low, uh, more, more distant and more clear. So some people got the idea of doing this not far, but in the retina, correcting for optical aberrations and trying to see single photoreceptors. In fact, some of these people got the, the Champalimau Prize for this ingenious application of something that was developed in the field of astronomy to the field of retinal imaging. And now we can image. It's probably the only cell type you can imagine, you can image while talking with somebody, which is quite, um, quite incredible. Uh, but I also want to talk about engineering and design. You know, because then we go back to the discussion between Dar Darwin and the opponents of evolution when Darwin and Wallace developed their, their, uh, their theory. Because there was the big claim, how cannot be a creator if you have such a perfect thing as an eye? And it's actually, it's interesting to see that the eye is very imperfect. So in fact, for the light to cross the retina, to reach the photoreceptors, it has to cross several layers before it reaches the photoreceptor. So this is the worst kind of design you could imagine. So it's not at all perfect, uh, but still, it's probably the best camera that is available on Earth. Uh, I, I don't have much time to talk about it, but we also think a lot about how to design a good imaging system, and still the eye is the best one. And now, I, will ask you, I would like you to ask you what is color. Probably everyone, that's a question I ask to my students every year, and I never get the correct response. Um, and you might ask, well, oh, come on, I know what is color, I can perceive color. Uh, and then I ask them, is color related to the discrimination of wavelengths? And then they say, of course it is, color is wavelength. Um, these are uh, things that people Actually, I also ask this to psychology students, not only to biomedical engineering, but I will try to, to explain you what color really is, and then you may disagree or not with me in the end. So let's try to address this from a physical point of view. Uh, you have the light, you need the sunlight or some source of light to illuminate the apple, and you can describe the source of illumination calculating a spectrum this is the spectrum. Um, so for each wavelength, you have an amplitude or a power, it doesn't matter. And you have a spectrum of the, uh, the illuminant. So you can characterize any light source using a description like this. And then the apple reflects the color. So that is the illuminant, that is the reflectance function, which is actually here. So what this tells you is that apple Red apple likes to reflect long wavelengths. This is what this graph means. So apple prefers to reflect some wavelengths. But what reaches your eyes is a combination between these two functions. This is what your eyes see, this function. Of course, the eye does not see a function, but the eye sees a combination of the illuminant and the, the surface that reflects. But now let, let's imagine that uh, I use not uh, 
not the sunlight, but the blue lamp. The function is very strange, is this function. So the illumination is very different. Of course, the apple still has his own pro its own properties, still prefers to reflect red, but what reaches the eye is completely different from the sunlight. So here, this is sunlight. Here, this is the blue lamp, completely different. So our brain is very clever because it extracts exactly the same color irrespective of what reaches the eye. And so now I ask you, what is color? It's a property of what? Color in terms of cognitive neuroscience. OK, color, color is a property of a, a perceived surface. The color belongs from the point of view of the brain, from the point of view of the brain, the color, be, the property belongs to the apple. Our brain is interested on the properties of the apple. And thereby, the brain says to the observer, you are seeing an object that prefers to reflect red wavelengths, long wavelengths. So the brain is not interested on the absolute amount of light or amount of, wave, of light per wavelength. So color is a surface property of an object. And this leads us to the notion that color cannot be perceived by the retina because the brain first needs to know what are the objects before it gives a property to the object. So if you do uh, object-oriented programming, you define a class of objects, and then you define properties of the object. Here is the same. You cannot define color without defining an object or a surface from the brain point of view. And of course, this is also a very important problem in, uh, in uh, vi uh, com computational vision and robotics. So from cognitive system point of view, you can only define a color in terms of a property of an object. That's why we have more than 10 or 20 brain regions decoding color. It's not just the retina. So the retina is not sufficient for color perception. Um, I th so this is more or less what this, um, what this slide says. The information reaches the brain, the visual cortex. There is another issue. You see that if I look the face at this boy, the face becomes very big in the brain, but his arm and the apple are very small. Our brain this focuses and amplifies the information that it considers relevant. So what we see in the, in the brain is always, I would not say a distortion, but an amplification of what are the relevant features. Uh, this slide, it's, I will not have time to explain it, so I will just tell you the notion that in the photoreceptors cannot perceive color. You might think, okay, if I have one, just one photoreceptor, this one, the blue, it, it has a peak for a given wavelength. So if a photoreceptor prefers some wavelength, why is it not enough to have color perception just with one photoreceptor? The reason is uh, here. Imagine this green photoreceptor. The photoreceptor has exactly the same activation for this green stimulus and for this blue stimulus. So a bad stimulus, the blue stimulus, if it's strong enough, can activate as much as a green stimulus. So the photoreceptor does not know. So it's impossible to have color perception just based on one photoreceptor. And I will close the color stuff quickly, but just to tell you, most of what I'm saying was predicted by physicists. So before any cone, any photoreceptor was discovered, some guys, young, predicted the existence of three sensors in the, in the, in, in the retina. And then so there were some color illusions that could not be explained by this simple model. And then a guy called Herring, a physicist, came and said, this is because there must be some type of sensor in the retina that integrates this information. And these sensors are now called ganglion cells. So these guys predicted the existence of particular biological entities, cell types, just based on, uh, on color perception phenomena. There is a science called colorimetry. I have no time to talk about. This is a very funny science, the science of measuring color. We have to work a lot on that if you want to work with color. It's very funny because it has to join very different worlds of a psychologist and a physicist. It's impossible to perceive colorimetry just being a physicist as it is impossible just being a psychologist. It's really a clash of, an interesting clash of, wor uh, uh, of worlds. 
Of course, this is an area that interest, is of interest to uh, graphic designers, architects, people working in dentistry because they want that color appearance uh, is the same depending of the, independent of the context. But I have no time just to give you an example how cognitive neuroscience and technology join. We use this to diagnose diseases. We use the way people navigate in the color space. We can measure and diagnose different types of visual diseases like glaucoma and other genetic disorders. But I have no time to talk about it. I just want to give you a concept that is both biological and engineering. In night vision, there is very little light. And you may have thousands of sensors collecting this light. But the light is so small in night that these thousand sensors can converge only to one cell to sum up all these information. This is an incredible amount of convergence. It's very useful if you have very tiny amounts of light and you need to integrate it to, sum, to perceive something. So it's amazing and you might say, oh, it's nice. We, we can detect light because we just converge, converge, converge. But think about a camera that has five megapixels converging to a camera with just one megapixel. This convergence is very bad for resolution. So for some things, convergence is very bad, and that's why we don't have this convergence in the places in the retina where we need high resolution. So vision and light is a lot about contrast. Here you probably see a darker than B, but if I close them, they are absolutely identical. You see, probably many of you know this illusion. Uh, if you want to have an explanation, let's do it in the discussion. But this is what many computer scientists would have, they would like to have their artificial vision systems to have these illusions, because this would mean there is something working properly in the system. Sometimes illusions are good, this is an artifact of, of us being able to perceive contrast. And we have cells in the brain that can detect contrast, like the difference between red and green. This, they are really small sensors that detect the difference between blue and yellow, red and green, black and white. And you can trace these cells up to the single cell level. Now, I think I, I go now to the technology part, but very quickly. You can also use light, and in fact, light is a relative concept. Many people define light what is in the visible spectrum, but the visible spectrum is not fixed. You have species of flies that can see in the ultraviolet, and you have species of mice that can see in the ultraviolet. And so, although light is in general defined about the visible spectrum, this is not at all fixed. And so, this is another concept that I would like to break. There is not such a thing as the fixed visible spectrum. But of course, we use light properties of tissues to do imaging. And I will finish quickly with that. So you can do techniques such as functional magnetic resonance imaging and uh, take, uh, take advantages of the different uh, properties of the tissue. And in the case of uh, magnetic resonance imaging, you take you use a different type of radiation, it's not exactly right, light. But so you, you we use, we go beyond the visible spectrum and take uh, advantage of the interactions between light and matter to find beautiful maps in the brain. Like, for instance, here we have a map of direction of movement, which is, I know which neurons where in the brain respond to which direction of movement. We do retinal imaging. This is an image of the retina using a technique that is based uh, on around 1,000 nanometer light. And based on an interferometry principle, we can generate very high resolution images of the retina. So we can you take advantage of the inter interaction between light and matter to develop new imaging techniques. This is an exploding, never ending field. There was just a call in the European Union on development of new imaging techniques, there were 500 grant applications just on the development of new diagnostic techniques in medicine. So we have a big array of techniques that I will not, I don't have time, I have to close, from molecular imaging to magnetic resonance. Molecular imaging using the, uh, the PET, um, this is an MR scanner, but we, we use PET to make uh, uh, visible molecules 
in the picomolar range. This is an incredible feat of technology to transform a biological signal into an image. I don't have time to, to go into that. Actually, we use also a lot of light to measure interaction in virtual reality systems. We use uh, infrared light to measure, to track the pupil and see how kids in that, in, with autism interact in a virtual environment. I don't have time to play the video on how an autistic kid uh, interacts with this scene. Uh, uh, I already described that we use light a lot for tracking, tracking motion and eye movements. And I will close showing you beautiful images of the brain. We are measuring receptors in the brain. This, in this case, are in, in inhibitory receptors. These are um, molecules that are very important in Parkinson's disease, the dop dopamine receptor. We can visualize in Parkinson's syndrome. So we can take use of imaging techniques and of light to really have very advanced applications in medicine. In this case, for brain mapping, we can, uh, uh, for instance, detect Alzheimer's disease, detecting with imaging techniques. Well, I'm not talking about the visible spectrum. Here I'm talking about photons with very high energy. But so we are talking about interactions between photon and matter to get this beautiful imaging of the brain. This is an Alzheimer disease patient that is accumulating a lot of amyloid, the Alzheimer disease molecule in his brain. So the EBLE is a research really dedicated to light. ICNES is an institute, a, a very big infrastructure on medical imaging. This is the small unit that produces these tiny molecules, well, these molecules that you can inject and then get these beautiful images in the brain. Thank you for your attention, and I try to be fast. Okay, questions? Please? Anybody? Oh, yes. Uh, I have a, uh, one question. Uh, you are saying that the, the color is not a, pro it's a property of the object. Uh, there are a few experiments, uh, even for science communication, like here in Pavilion, where we, using different uh, types of light, different colors of light, yeah. we can uh, see an object, and we can see an object with different colors. Yes. How you explain that yeah. based on your theory? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that follows up uh, from the slides I showed. The, the phenomena I demonstrated, you perceive, the, you perceive the red apple, whatever the illumination, is called color constancy. You have another example here in the Pavilion do Conhecimento called size constancy. Your size is the same if you are here or there. Of course, there are some conditions, so nature makes us perceive objects as constants, otherwise we would go crazy. You know, imagine you are uh, in a battle, you want to, to evaluate the size of your enemy, you want to have a very good size perception. And our biology makes it so that we can have a constant perception of size, regardless of distance or color, regardless of illumination. These are what we call constancy or invariance, which is a very important concept also in artificial or computational neuroscience. Now, there are some circumstances where this constancy breaks. And that's very nice to show in a science museum. So if you have a room uh, that is not symmetrical, since your brain is expecting a symmetrical room, you are tricked by the scenario. Uh, if you have a, a very strange illumination, you can also be tricked. Fortunately for us, perception is probabilistic. So constancy does not break in 95% of the circumstances but sometimes it breaks, but evolution um, selected our biology so, such that this constancy is preserved most of the times. Any other question? Uh, I don't see any hands. So let me just comment on something you said. Uh, by, 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 by trade and by training, um, telecoms uh, had a, an important now it's not so important, but it's still important in the life of everybody, which is television. So a television forced the study of colors and yes. forced the study of uh, lots of phenomena, phenomena around colors. And what I 
said to you, okay, you said the apple is red, whatever the light, this is half true. Yes, exactly. With an right. apple, maybe. But there's also an old saying in Portuguese, I will try to translate it uh, as, as best as I can in English, which says that at night, all cats look alike. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which means, if you don't know what the object is, I change the light and you get all the colors of the, of, the, of the rainbow. I just change the light because, as you mentioned very carefully, and yes, you have a lot of brain power behind the cortex. And that brain power is, is really uh, what tells you what the light, sh what it should, color should be. Yeah. But if you don't have a, a, a basis to, to see, oh, that must be an apple, yeah. so that must be red. Yeah. You, you don't yeah. know if it's red yeah. or white or gray or yellow, or blue or whatever. Now, but, but I have a question for you. <laughs> but may I comment on what yeah, you please, said? Please. It's a bit related to the, the question. I, uh, there is, in fact, this is embedded in what you call Bayesian th theories of perception. So you can never, our brain is also never sure, is that really an object? So it's a segmentation problem. So our brain does a lot of probabilistic heuristics. So of course the brain is not even sure whether there is an apple. So I completely agree with you. And this is it, uh, embedded in Bayesian uh, probabilistic theories of perception. So then the brain uh, combines the best probability models to, to reach to the best perceptual decision. The question I had to you is an interesting one. Now, we all have as you just mentioned, three types of cones, one sensitive to, to red, the other one to blue, the other one to green. Right, okay. We are all different. Yeah. And uh, the electrical stimulus that goes to our brain is not different from the blue receptor, green receptor, or the red receptor. Yeah. Yet, 99.9% .9 of the people can identify the same color, even if it is composed uh, of, of, you know, a number of, of, of stimulation. So, yeah. even if we, I think blue means blue to most people, yeah. except those who are colored. Yeah. Forget about those. And red means red to most people. Why is that so? I mean, why should we look at blue and see blue? and look at red and see red. Yeah, that's, I mean, a, <coughs> I, yeah, that's a, a nice question. Of course it will, no. <laughs> um, so what you're talking about is two different concepts. One is categorization. So, you know, in some cultures you only have five color categories. In others you have 11 or many more. And uh, the other is discrimination, you know. And concerning discrimination we understand much better, you know. So I can, I, I, in discrimination experiments, I don't give color any name. You know, I just say this color is different from that one, whatever my cultural name to it. So sometimes I name green and my kids name blue and, you know. So this is categorization and it's, many people believe it's a cultural and psychological construct. But so the fact that my, my kids name color in a way doesn't mean that I'm worse than them. So discrimination is an ability to really say this is different from that regardless of what the name I give to the caller. So this uh, uh, I would call discrimination ability. The other is categorization which is not an ability, is the way you call things. You know, you could say the same things about races like you could define the, the mankind in ten races or three races or four. So I see color categorization a bit like that. Then there is a big question how much this is acquired and how much uh, this, there is a genetic uh, imprinting to the way we categorize color and it is very difficult to answer. Thank you. No further questions? Oh, there are comments on there. <laughs> Carlos, I was amazed by your comment, uh, so I have also a comment. Your <laughs> comment was biased by your background as a telecommunications guy, as a the, the presentation was biased by the neurological background of the presenter. I will give you my comment as a physicist. The real color of the head is a mathematical transformer. 
the Hepler is no color at all. And there is an expression, a mathematical expression, ex only for Hepu, because it is different for all the other objects in the room, that relates uh, the, is the, the light that goes there and light that comes out. So the real color is a mathematical transform. Even, even if it is dark, it's the same mathematical transform. May I make a comment on that? <laughs> um, of course, I, also, I, I believe that every, when the brain extracts color, it, it is a result of some kind of mathematical computation in the synapses, so I agree with you. But I just give you an example of a, 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 a clinical case described in a book of Oliver Sacks that actually relates to giving names to colors because the guy came to the clinic and said he could not see any color anymore. But then they gave him a, a, a task where he had to discriminate wavelengths, and he was perfect. So he could actually discriminate wa wavelengths, but they were all in ta tones of uh, gray. You know? So if, you, if a brain says, I see a color, it's a construction. It's, I, I agree it's a mathematical construction. No. But it's a, uh, there is a definition, biological definition of color that is object-centered. So I agree with you, but you know, uh, an artificial vision system would like to have the formula based on a biological system because wants to have the same interpretation. You are completely right. Yeah. When I was meaning, the, telling about the transform for yeah. the Hapel as relating the light that goes on and light that comes out, was just forgetting about the observer. Yeah. The difference is you put an observer there, which means an eye, yeah. and means a brain. And yeah. that is a, a second degree transform, much yeah. more complicated yeah. and complex yeah. than yeah. first transform. And many people are trying to do research precisely on that, on models that tell you the color. Thank you. Uh, I think that we could stay on, on and on and on and on. <laughs> but I must, you know, look at my watch and try to, to keep the time right. So now we go to thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> and now closer to home, um, closer to telecoms. Light can be used also for communication. Uh, not in the you know in the way we can use it by waving, which is communication again, but uh, by sending a lot of information, yeah. and, and this is interesting because uh, um, the um, optical fibers were discovered in 1908, I think, give or take, and the use of them to communication as a work of 1966 by George Hockham and Charles Cow, uh, that gave to Charles Cow the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011 or 12. Nine? 2009. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting thing. So I think uh, Paul is a physicist by yeah. nature, a telecom man by trade. <laughs> uh, he'll tell us a lot about how to use light to communicate. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. Well, in fact, um, in my presentation, we will be just starting by a brief overview of some historic milestones on optical communications and try to predict how will be the future. So, in fact, uh, as you know, uh, communication is a basic human need. Uh, in early days, we started in communication using sound. And the first report of using light for communication came from about uh, 1,000 years before Christ with the use of the fire towers and mirrors in ancient Greece and also almost simultaneously uh, with use of smoke si signals in ancient China and on North America. Uh, later on, the first, let's say, network using uh, optical signals to communicate was implemented in France. In fact, it was in France, north of Italy, Belgium, and Netherlands. And, uh, well, they use uh, some kind of towers with uh, a, a wooden structure on the top. And by moving this wooden structure, they could communicate. Of course, they have a lot of problems. But this was, in fact, the first record of uh, optical communication network and long-haul communication network. Just 
This was implemented about 50 years before Samuel Morse invented the telegraph. And also another historical mark was in 1966 with the first deployed commercial transatlantic cable. And just to have an idea, the price to send 10 words was the equivalent of more than 1,000 euros from today. And at that time, they could send about eight words per minute using that transatlantic cable. Well, 19th century, a lot of discoveries. Maxwell describes the electromagnetic theory. We have the Alexander Bell invented the telephone in uh, 1876. And just two years after that, he proposed a, a, pat a patent for uh, what they call a photophone. Well, the idea was to try to reflect the sunlight in a movable membrane, and by this way, to communicate. Of course, it tested, it works, but was not, not, was not implemented in large scale. They had a lot of problems, mainly with the transmission channel. A few years later, we have the first communication, uh, radio communication by Marconi, and about 50 uh, years later, we have the first coaxial cable, handling more than uh, 36 phone calls in simultaneous. Well, in 1960, we have, like you say, the born of the modern optical communication with the demonstration of the first laser made by Maine. We just followed the theoretical proposal of uh, Charles Stone, who received the Nobel in 1964. And then just two years after that, we have the first semiconductor laser. And then, like Carlos uh, Salema referred, we have in the 60s a lot of work from Charles Cow proposing, conceiving the uh, optical communications, the use of optical fibers for communications. And then, just a few years after that, we have the production of the first commercial optical fibers by uh, Corning. <clears throat> Meanwhile, we have also some developments in the optoelectronics, the production of uh, semiconductor lasers that could work at room temperature and that could be used to, uh, as optical sources for the optical communication uh, uh, fibers. Well, we have to wait more than 20 years to see another achievement, and at this point, the idea was to try to increase the coverage of the optical communication networks and also to increase the capacity of these networks. And, well, next milestones was, in fact, the invention of the urban Doppler uh, amplifier uh, in, eight, in 1989 and a few years later, the introduction of what we call the wavelength multiplexing system. That is the idea to put more signals, more lasers emitting for the same fiber. So by this way, we could increase uh, the capacity, the total capacity of the fiber. Well, in 2005, we have the 40, what you call the 40 gigabit per second systems. Well, just to have an idea, we could use these systems to transmit about 10 million phone calls in simultaneous. And, well, this is the equivalent to send the British Encyclopedia in less than one second by using one of these channels. Well, why is the optical so important? Well, maybe if we look to this graphic, we could check it why, uh, where is the importance of the optics. Well, if we want, we, we want to transmit a signal with a very high bit rate, well, of course, we have to use optics. If you want uh, to increase or to send a signal with a very uh, long propagation distance, well, probably here you can use a microwave link. But if you want to, at the same time, have a very large distance and also a very large uh, data rate, well, in this case, for sure that the optics or the fiber optics communications is the chosen uh, technology. In simultaneously with the, the development of the fibers, there was also uh, a large work, large investments in the production of electronics, very fast electronics. And just to have an idea, well, the first transistor was invented in 1947, and just 50 years later, well, you see here, 50, here, 50 years later, we have a microprocessor with more than 10 million transistors. So just in 50 years, we passed from one to 10 millions in one chip. In fact, this evolution was predicted by uh, Moore's, uh, Gordon Moore, what is called the Moore's Law. He said that, well, the, the capacity, the density of uh, an um, integrated circuit will double each year. It's more or less uh, a given trend. And in fact, that started in 1960, and up to now, this, uh, this provision uh, is updated. So we have an increase in about one, one and a half years of the capacity of the density of the integrated circuits. 
just to have an, one idea, how dense are the uh, electronic circuits that are used to uh, process the data that is sent in uh, an optical fiber. Just have here some, picture, uh, some pictures of uh, um, transistor. So this is the gate of the transistor. This is the dimension of the gate of the transistor. So you can see here, typically, we have 50 nanometers. That is the typical dimension of the, one of the contacts of the transistor. And just to compare it with the size of the influenza virus. So the uh, electrical contacts that are used uh, on the electronics is, uh, are smaller than the size of the influenza virus. So in fact, we have a very high density of electronic circuits, so you can process a lot of information, and this information can be transmitted in an optical fiber. Oh, in terms of coverage, um, this is the map showing the uh, optical cables that were deployed in 1901. And if we compare it with the cables that are deployed today, well, it's not visible, but they are more or less the same. So we have the same coverage, geographical coverage. The main difference is, on, is the capacity. So at that time, you could send a few words per minute. Now you can send more than 10 gigabits per second in each fiber. So it's a large increase in terms of capacity. Nowadays, also, uh, we have two main objectives. One is access networks, that is sending the fiber to the home of, of the subscriber, sending the fiber to the home of user. Uh, and we have some operators in Portugal that already put in the, in the house of the user uh, of nautical fiber, and also the convergence of the services. We can have on the same fiber different technologies and also di different services like voice, the data, television, digital so television, etc. So these are, in fact, the two, two words and the two uh, uh, the two, two terms that, are, uh, imp or th that were implemented in the last years. And also on this graphic is visible the evolution since the first commercial optical communication system, so, so before 1980, up to 2005, 2010. And what, uh, independently of the technology, what we see is we have an annual increase of about 50% on the capacity per fiber. So each year, the capacity is increasing about 50%. And what about the future? Well, someone quote, quoted this uh, news board in the last panel. Uh, news board said that predictions is very difficult, especially if it is about the future. Also in Portugal, we have a similar quotation. It's uh, João Pinto that was a soccer player say more or less the same thing. And uh, in fact, if we, we look to the, some provisions, for instance, for these size provisions about the capacity the capacity of the optical of the, all the data communications we see this is specifically for the IP traffic, but we see that we have an increase that is more than 20 percent per year in terms of total capacity of the, the, net, the networks. And um, how close are we from the limit? Well, we cannot increase forever. Uh, and in fact, uh, Shannon have many years ago studied what were what was the maximum capacity of a communication system. And well, this is quoted here by this line, black line. And well, even for some technologies, we are close, but not so close like that. This is a logarithmic scale, so we are about one half or one third from that limit. So we can, we can improve a little more and try to achieve this channel limit for the, the communications. Um, and how is uh, information introduced on the optical fiber? and on the optical signal. Usually, we say that you use the physical dimensions uh, of the photons. And what are the physical dimensions? Well, well we have the space dimension. That is, we can use two different fibers, so two different channel, uh, channels. We can use polarization, so you can have some photons with some information in uh, vertical polarization and other photons with other information in horizontal polarization, and they don't mix. At, at the end, I could separate the photons and obtain the two channels of information. So this is what we call polarization multiplexing. Also, we can use the frequency or the wavelength that is putting several lasers with different uh, wavelengths on the same fiber. So this is done in commercial systems. We can have more than 100 uh, lasers, each one with a different wavelength sending the signals to the same optical fiber. We also could use code codification, that is okay, the way I put the information, the, 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 the way uh, I process the information and the way uh, I put it on the, uh, on the channel. 
we also have uh, amplitude and quadrature. That is, I could change the amplitude and the phase of the photons, and by this way, I could also uh, introduce the information on the fiber. And we have time. So if you com communicate using uh, digital signals, if you reduce the time of uh, its uh, bit, you are increasing the capacity. Well, recently, uh, some researchers start working with what they call orbital angular momentum. So the idea is to use also the angular momentum, not the polarization, but the angular momentum of the photons. And by this way, we could uh, multiplex the information. So there are a lot uh, of ways we could uh, introduce the information on the photons. And all of them, uh, except this one, but all of these six are used nowadays in commercial systems. And OK the research and the development are focused on these, uh, on these uh, physical dimensions and how to increase the capacity using these six traditional dimensions and more recently, this one that uh, I refer the optical angular momentum. Well, just to finalize, let me just show you this curiosity. In fact, Charles Kao received the Nobel Prize of Physics in 2009, and that was about, what, 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 it was exactly 100 years after Marconi received also the same prize for the development of the radio. So nowadays, the basic of technology are radio, Wi-Fi, wireless mobiles, mobile uh, systems, and also the optical fibers. And the persons that developed these systems received the Nobel Prize of Physics, but what, with a, a time lag of 100 years. OK, just to finalize, let me just say that what we expect here in terms of optical communications is, well, a future full of light. Thank you very much for your attention. Just <laughs> Thank you, Paulo. Uh, questions, please? No questions? No questions. No. No. Our last question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would like Paulo to, to, to come to a, a point which is an interesting one. An optical fiber is a very, very thin cylinder of two types of glass, basically. Yep. And, uh, but I mean very thin, I mean thinner than a woman's hair. The question is, you put uh, one channel, two channels, three channels, a hundred channels yep. on the same fiber. Uh, uh, well, there's a time where the density of energy in that fiber reaches a problem which is similar to the same problem that you have when you put too much current in a wire. Yeah, that's right. It melts. Now, uh, what do you do about it? And where is the future? OK. OK, uh, like I said, if we go for these multiplexed systems, for instance, the frequency multiplexing, that means we put more than 100 channels. We could also in inject uh, optical signals to make the amplification on the fiber. So we, we could have more than one watt of power in an area that is uh, around 80 uh, square micrometers. So it's a very high density. Um, but in some old fibers, uh, we had uh, some very large problems because, in fact, we have the melting of the fiber. Uh, it melts, it burns. Uh, it burns and uh, it, uh, we have a floating zone, a melting zone that propagates towards the emitter. Um, the only way to reduce this problem is in fact, well, not injecting so much, so much power on the fiber and try to avoid old fibers with a very high uh, absorption coefficient and try uh, also to avoid uh, that fibers could be used in some places with very tight curvatures. So these are basically the ways that uh, we could uh, uh, avoid this phenomenon that is called the fuse effect. Uh, but like I said, well, we expect to observe the fuse effect in normal fibers at powers more than, higher than two watts. And at this moment, typically, we can have up to one watt of uh, power injected on the fibers. But like you said, it, it's a, a very high density uh, because it's one watt in 80 square uh, micrometers. So it's a very, very high, uh, very, very high uh, density. 
We have also some work, we on IT, uh, and the uh, 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 next speaker will, sp uh, will talk about optical sensors. Uh, in fact, we have, in, in, in the past, and you still do it, uh, using this kind of uh, destruction to produce optical sensors. So we, destruct, uh, we destroy the fiber, and then from the destroyed fiber, you produce optical sensors from that fiber. So we don't use it for communications anymore, but you use it for, for sensing. Um, but well, we have this limitation. No more than two watts, but two watts, it's, for two watts in optics, it's a very, very high power. No more questions. Uh, I'd like to thank. Paul. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, well, let's use optical fibers for something else, not for telecommunications, but for sensing. So our last speaker, uh, Luis Ferreira, we're talking about that. Uh, can you put the presentation with the stripes? Well, good afternoon. Thank you for staying. Uh, thank you also for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here to talk about this fascinating team. Uh, so, Paulo mentioned the. Uh, can I control it? Thank you. So Paulo just mentioned the utilization of optical fiber for telecom. So in fact, optical fiber is connecting today's world. Um, I would like to mention a different use of optical fiber. So if you have an optical fiber and you inject uh, light in the optical fiber, you can characterize that light by some parameters. So essentially amplitude, wavelength, frequency, phase polarization. And uh, when light propagates along the fiber, and due to the action of some external parameters, uh, you can, in fact, have some modulation on these uh, essential characteristics. So if you relate that modulation with the parameters that have act on the optical fiber, you have the optical fiber acting as a sensor. And you can have the entire optical fiber working as a sensor, and we talk about distributed uh, fiber sensors. You can have it only in one point, and then it's a, a, a point sensor, or you can have it in different points along the same fiber, and we, call about, uh, we talk about quasi-distributed sensing, which is the topic of my talk to you today. So essentially, I would like to explain how we do this type of quasi-distributed sensors. So if you can, excuse me, can you put the film on, please? So essentially, we have a small movie that shows how we change the optical fiber in order to make it sensitive to different parameters. So using uh, UV light uh, and generating an interference pattern, if we have an optical fiber that has uh, enough uh, uh, germanium doping or we uh, uh, hydrogenate in order to make it photosensitive, we can change the uh, index of refraction in a periodic way like that microstructure that you see, which will be permanently inscribed in the core of the optical fiber with around five millimeters length. And then by uh, injecting uh, uh, a broad spectrum in the optical fiber, you can have a reflection at a specific wavelength so that microstructure becomes a, a, a spectrally selective uh, um, uh, mirror. Now, acting on the optical fiber, you change slightly the wavelength. So I leave it up to you if I change the color or just the wavelength, but I change something. And uh, if I uh, uh, establish a relation between that change and the parameter that acts on that microstructure, I have this type of fiber regulating sensors. And the, the great thing about these sensors is that I can have 
uh, hundreds of these sensors in an optical fiber. They can be as near as a few millimeters or as a, uh, apart from four kilometers. And they, have, uh, they are multifunctional because on the same optical fiber, I can have different types of sensors. So I can use transduction methods to measure on the same optical fiber different parameters. And I know exactly what a sensor is measuring what because I know it's a spectral signature. Uh, the advantages of this technology are enormous because we are talking about optical fiber. Of course, we can use it where we have large uh, um, uh, interference, large electromagnetic fields, but it's also great to use when I have large structures and I want to have uh, a large number of sensors. Uh, so we, it becomes competitive also in this uh, situation. So going back to the presentation, please. Thank you. So at uh, fiber sensing, we have been working this technology for 10 years. Fiber sensing is a spin-off from Ines Porto. And uh, we were acquired by HBM last October. Uh, and in Maya, we have uh, about 45 people working exclusively uh, devoted to, the, to this technology. So essentially uh, uh, providing sensors, measurement units, software, and complete solutions for different applications uh, in construction, energy, aerospace, industry, and uh, transportation. Um, some of the sensors we made up of those structures. So we have this tiny optical fiber that in principle is something fragile, and now we have to transform it in real sensors that we can use in real world. So we use different transduction methods to measure different parameters, but also different packaging methods in order to use uh, these sensors in lab, but also in structures, embedding composites, um, well to metallic structures. So I give here examples of uh, strain sensors with different packaging going from very simple, um, very simple uh, uh, sensor to sensors that can be embedded in concrete, more complex uh, structures, all based in the same uh, technology. Other types of sensors for temperature, for example, acceleration as well. And uh, the great thing is that you can combine all these sensors and you can put between them a few kilometers or you can connect them uh, with the separation of only one meter. And everything will be acquired in the same uh, channel of uh, an interrogator. This is the typical interrogators that we produce at HBM Fiber Sensing for uh, addressing and these complex sensing networks. So you can have up to eight optical channels, and on each of these optical channels, you can have tens of sensors for different parameters. Software to, uh, so you see here, for example, the reflection of, and the spectra reflected from uh, a chain of optical sensors in the same optical channel, and more complex products like combination of different types of sensors in uh, uh, sensing arrays, um, uh, measurement units with particular characteristics, or sensors uh, made, uh, tailored made for uh, integrating in some engineering solutions. Now, regarding applications, one of the most common applications is in civil infrastructures, like I mentioned, because um, usually you have a large area where you need to uh, deploy a large number of sensors and by using this technology it allows you not to use any active elements in, this, in the structure. So it can be used to uh, help during construction, it can be uh, used for load tests and it can be used for condition monitoring during the service life. Um, as an example, I show here one of our first projects, in fact, which was the Rocio Tunnel here in Lisbon, where we have installed uh, almost 18 kilometers of optical fiber inside the tunnel. We have approximately uh, 872 sensors monitoring the structure, and there is no active equipment inside the tunnel. So everything that is in, inside the tunnel are optical fibers and light. Everything is passive. In the meantime, we have installed the same uh, solution in the Sao Paulo subway, and we will be installing it in Caracas soon, I hope, if nothing strange happens. 
Um, this technology, the interrogators that we produce at HBM Fiber Sensing, are also uh, useful for interferometric sensors because we use a tunable laser, so if we sweep the tunable laser over an interferometric, signal, uh, interferometric sensor, we get a channel spectrum, and it, they can also be used for this type of sensors. So we are supplying an uh, important company in uh, uh, Canada with our technology uh, for use in their uh, sensors, which are mainly used for monitoring buildings, uh, particularly in Asia, where they have hundreds of sensors installed in buildings due to seismic uh, problems. In energy, uh, our activity has been essentially focused on Siemens. Uh, we have many projects with Siemens in both Europe and the US, but particularly in the US, we have started a long time ago a collaboration for the development of vibration, temperature, and strain monitoring systems for power generators. So power generators, they need uh, um, a lot of sensors, and we are working on systems for monitoring temperature, for monitoring vibration and strain, and also to monitor the balance of the power generator. Uh, this is an example of a system complete vibration monitoring system that we produce with the Siemens brand, and that uh, goes from the measurement unit down to 16 vibration sensors that are installed in the power generator. You see here the vibration sensor, and then you see the system here in the power plant for monitoring the power generator. Uh, another application, power transformers. The lifetime of a power transformer can change drastically uh, if the hot spot uh, temperature is too high. And for what spot I mean the winding uh, temperature. So there are points in the windings that the temperature can raise very high. And if uh, we don't monitor that, the expected time life of the power generator, uh, power transformer goes really low. So once again, we are not addressing this market directly. We are doing it through a company in Germany. So we are producing a complete system for them, which is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, made by probes, temperature probes with three points for the windings, the measurement unit, cables, and the feed throughs to pass the optical fibers from inside to outside the power uh, transformer. A good application for this technology is the wind generation, which was mentioned here. Uh, earlier, and in this case, um, the uh, technology is particularly suitable because you have lightning that go mm, that goes through the blades, and uh, uh, in some applications you want to measure, for example, the load here in the root of the blades in order to control the pitch, to optimize the efficiency. Um, in that case, we have this system that can be installed in the hub together with uh, um, four strain sensors and four temperature sensors on each blade. Uh, we have been installing this system uh, around the world. I have here an example of a system installed last uh, December in US, uh, and here you see the blade inside. Oops. You see the blade inside, the installation of the temperature and strain sensors, and the measurement unit installed in the hub. We have been installing this system uh, in China and most, more recently in Denmark. So, uh, Aerospace. Aerospace, we have been essentially involved through R&D projects uh, that can be uh, European funded or uh, uh, European Space Agency funded, but also some direct contracts. So I would just mention um, these two important ones we had uh, with the European Space Agency, essentially for developing uh, sensors and measurement units for launchers or for satellite mockups. Uh, also with Airbus, we had a very important uh, project for stress monitoring in composite uh, fuel tanks, because airplanes that use composite fuel tanks, the, the, the tanks don't, no longer uh, act like a Faraday cage. So 
if you use electrical sensors, you have problems again with lightning. And this technology allows you to use safely sensors on the fuel tanks. Um, we have a new project with the, uh, in the framework of the Clean Sky for developing, again, for Airbus, uh, a miniaturized acquisition system for brake ratings. Other markets, just briefly, uh, pipeline monitoring. We are not directly in the oil and gas industry, but we are on the pipelines because it is um, very important to monitor uh, strain, deformation, uh, uh, tilt in this type of uh, structures. And see here an example of a pipeline that was instrumented by HBM Fiber Sensing. Uh, last month we installed a very big system in uh, near Innsbruck in Austria for a pipeline where the sensors were submitted to a pressure of 100 bar because of the height of the mountain. This, in this case we are not producing these. These are the riser pipes that are used for uh, oil and gas but we are supplying the fiber arrays, Optimet fiber arrays. And in this case, you see that we have 40 sensors installed in this special tube. So only one optical channel, you can monitor the fatigue of the tube in 40 points. A more, uh, let's say, common application is uh, this container uh, cranes that are present in arbors. If you are only uh, piling these containers without any information about its load and more important, its load distribution, you can uh, have problems like this. So we have developed uh, some sensors for these twist locks that transform each of these twist locks in a load cell. So it allows the, the operator to have distribution of load on the container and optimize the construction, the, the load. What is interesting here is that this environment is really, really harsh. And it's very curious that in the end, it was optical fiber technology that was more suitable. Here you see some detail about the production of the sensors that are inserted here in the twist locks. Mm -hmm. Another application now for industry. Uh, Again, a company in Germany that has developed a system for monitoring uh, temperature in chemical reactors. So the objective is to have probes. In this case, we are qualifying the probes for with 15 sensors, but they want to go much higher, uh, around uh, 40 sensors per probe. And the measurement unit is already being tested on site. We expect to start uh, producing this as a OEM uh, next year. At last, I think, so we are talking a lot about energy, so the ITER project. We, together with uh, Smartec, we won the instrumentation uh, of the superconducting magnets uh, of the ITER. So we are right now producing around 600 sensors. Uh, for monitoring strain, displacement, and temperature in these very demanding uh, uh, conditions with uh, high radiation, vacuum, and high electromagnetic fields. So this is maybe the biggest project we are involved in, in terms of production um, right now. Okay, thank you. So if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Now questions. I'm sure somebody's going to ask some question. Anna, please. So I have a question. I don't know if it is for you or for uh, uh, Andre. Uh, how are the, the cables that you now put for telecommunications under, uh, on the seabed uh, what is the size, how do you put them actually, and uh, it, it, I imagine it's a, a bundle, no, mm -hmm. with lots of things. The, the, 
the optical fiber is 120 uh, uh, yeah, optical fiber. Yeah, optical fiber. Yeah. And and also, what is the 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 for those sensors of vibration? What is the precision? I mean, what kind of vibrations can they sense? The, in terms of the, the submarine cables, what happens is that the, the, the cables are produced in the same way or using very uh, similar technologies to the electric cables. So apart from the protection and the, the care that you need to have that if the cable is elongated, the fiber is not elongated, so it's somehow loose inside the, 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 the tubes, uh, it's very similar. So you have a strengthening uh, uh, part, uh, it's not very, very different from standard uh, cables. Uh, regard, hmm? which ones? There are, there are different types. There are cables that are only fixed in some uh, points. There are cables that are really buried. I think it's like this. Um, regarding the, the vibration here, we are uh, looking for sub-micron uh, uh, amplitude vibration. And the, the in fact, that application for the power generators is to look at the amplitude of the second harmonic. Because if a power generator is working perfectly, the second harmonic will be very reduced. So essentially, by monitoring the amplitude of the second harmonic, it's enough for the power engineers to know that something is wrong. It can be a simple unbalance, but something is wrong with the power generator. Exactly. Any more questions? No. In, in your company, do you produce also the electronics to measure? Yes. So uh, the, the question here is that the, the, the change in the reflected wavelength that the physical parameters induce is only in the range of few nanometers. So in fact, you need picometer resolution on measuring that, those changes. So uh, usually the, one of the most common uh, um, uh, approaches or techniques is to have a tunable laser that uh, you send on the optical fiber, then you receive the peaks and you do some type of in the end time measurement, reference time measurement. Uh, that is one of the technologies that we use. But we produce the tunable laser in-house and we produce the interrogator completely in-house as well as the sensors. Thank you. Any more questions, Anna? Please. Because this is this is just more common than a question. Is that I never realized now when you told about uh, the use of the fiber sensors uh, to monitor the um, the fuel tanks of the Airbus uh, for safety reasons. That it, I, I had never it had never occurred to me that when you have safety issues where you, you cannot use electricity mm -hmm. because of a short circuit, you have the solution of light. Yeah. That's something I, nev I had In never fact, thought those, about. Those are the two main, let's say, applications of optical fiber sensors. One is, for some reason, you cannot use standard sensors because of risk of explosion or high electromagnetic fields or lightning or something like that. So optical uh, uh, emerges as an option. The other one is when you have real, really large structures and uh, you need many sensors and you need to put them far away from your interrogator. So again, fiber optic uh, becomes as a, a, a good option. Okay, no more questions. So, Luis, thank you very much. Thank you. For Bom, mais uma vez terminamos a tempo, é fantástico. Agora estão todos convidados para irem connosco à recepção nos Patos do Conselho. Temos um autocarro ali fora, agora às seis e meia. E venham, vão gostar muito de ver o Salão Nobre e, de, e depois de ver aquele magnífico terreiro do passo com este fim de tarde. E amanhã cá estamos de novo. Obrigada.